And now I'd like to introduce to you our presenter, Lisa Rotelli. She has worked in the wheelchair industry for more than 25 years. She is currently Vice President of Adaptive Switch Lab and provides training nationally and internationally. A brief overview of our training today, it will cover the designs and manufacturers products that allow individuals with disabilities to use computers, communicate, interface with their environments, and achieve greater independence through powered mobility. ASL products are optical, electronic, mechanical, and proximity sensor switches to access an individual's wheelchair and accessories. Now we'll turn the time to presenter Lisa Rotelli. Ready? Hello, and thank you very much for having me here. I'd like to start a little bit with a, a, to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got to where I am today as far as um, really primarily working with clients that use alternative access for anything they do. Um, I started out in a rehab hospital uh, 27 years ago and my job there was to really work on seating positioning for clients to um, when we were working with them in the clinic and trying to get them in optimal position instead of putting them back into the wheelchair that they had just come in and, and collapsed just the same way, we would actually build our own seats out of foam and plywood and make customizations to them to try to help them maintain a posture so they could actually eat better, swallow better, and use, use uh, their wheelchairs better. So that's kind of how I got started in this path of, of where I am. And from there, I actually went to work for a wheelchair manufacturer um, uh, and a medical supplier. First the supplier and trying to get things funded and just primarily all working with equipment from becoming from the therapy land uh, where I was a PTA to working with clients and trying to get equipment for them to take home and follow them through with that equipment. And after that, I actually went to work for a manufacturer of equipment teaching electronics and working with clients again primarily that have actually not very good hand use or not very good head use um, and could have very little movement of anything or too much movement. So there's a spectrum of everything. And, you know, from my passion, I've always believed that everyone should be mobile and everyone should be able to access something in their life because that's what makes us be human beings. So. That's kind of how I fell into where I am today. I met uh, Rucker Ashmore, who owned Adaptive Switch Labs, and he made products that actually solved needs for uh, clients I was looking for. And hopefully by the end of the day, you'll see some of those products, and we will get started with the presentation. I also have a few things to go over some ground rules of how I think and hopefully how everybody will think when they're doing an assessment for somebody of finding a switch site. I get asked a lot to come help people um, find a switch site and I really do have to um, ask the first thing is what is the activity you're doing? What are we trying to access? Because that's more important than the switch itself or even the switch site. And I'll get to that a little bit further in, in the presentation, but I hope by the end of this that you will really realize is we have to have engaging activities for clients, whether they be, they're be very young or very old, for them to work hard and want to be able to do this. Because again, we're working with clients that don't have normal hand function and really um, sometimes they have processing problems, sometimes they have vision problems. So we're trying to decide a lot of things and we need to make something simple, but we can hardly get, get anywhere if they're not interested in the activity that we're trying to get them to do. So how do we decide a switch site for somebody? What switch do I use? You know, which mounting do I use? Where do I put the switch? And how do I determine if that has been successful? And in our field, it's a lot easier to determine when something is unsuccessful. <laughs> we can actually generate a product, whether that be writing on a, on a computer. To, to take a look at. And the switch site assessment, the one thing we really want to convey to everyone is the switch is never the activity. To, 
to talk to people and, and help them find a switch site. And in a few particular cases, I ask what the activity is that we're trying to um, access for that client. And I was told that actually they weren't using anything yet. They were just trying to find a site. And in my opinion, that's very reverse thinking. We have to have an activity in mind in order to understand how the client is going to access that. As human beings that we all are, we have to have interest in an activity to learn something and we have to have an understanding of what we're doing to actually even make a motor function happen. So we really do need to make sure the activity is something that everybody is interested in and known to somebody before we find a switch site to figure out where that's going to be. And what are you connecting to the switch? Is it a communication device? Is it a computer? Is it moving someone through space? Is it a toy? All of those things make a big difference. Does a client have interest in that activity? There's a lot of clients that we're trying to get to use communication devices that really don't understand the power of that device yet. So it's very difficult to understand if the switch site is what's failing or they are not understanding the device and, and what that's bringing to them. So all of those things are really, we have to take a look in the assessment process of is this something the client is interested in. And actually that's how I really fell in love with powered mobility because I never met anybody that didn't want to move themselves. So it's really easy, a lot easier, to figure out seating for access, to figure out the access method and point when someone is wanting to do what we're doing. And moving yourself, has I've never had somebody that didn't want to. So it makes it a lot easier on that spectrum to figure all of that stuff out. And um, is the access immediate? There's a lot of t also switches and devices and switches and mobility that someone can access a switch and nothing happens for several seconds. Well, here we are trying to decide if they're cognitively capable of the activity we're doing, if they have a processing problem or a vision problem, or maybe they're not even interested in the activity that we're trying to bring to them. And it really could be the fact that there is just a delay in the activation between the switch and the activity, the switch and the device. All of those things have to be immediate. When I touch a switch, that activation made something happen. And it's not I touch it and I wait, 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 now I'm going to say hi. It has to say hello the minute you touch it. And that really is the only way that we can, and I hate to use this term, determine cause and effect. Because if I tell them that you're going to touch a switch, you hear that click, switch click, and something's going to happen, well, that's not always the case first. But second of all, I'm, all I'm teaching them is to wait for an act, an, something to occur instead of saying, this is powerful. You touch it, that happened. You touch it, you move. You touch it, you talk. That's the only way I can make the switch again also not be the activity. So I want those totally away, and that's one reason I fell in love with sensors, which we'll get to in just a little bit. And the other thing for positioning, which is something, of uh, uh, course, that we talk about a lot at ASL, is a client ready for the activity you're doing? Whether that be powered mobility, whether that be a communication device or computer, are they ready? Are they positionally ready for something to happen? Or are they in the tilt and space chair that they got pushed into the room in that day, still tilted all the way back, looking at the ceiling, and we stuck something in front of them and said, try to make this work? We have to have transitions into and out of activities. We have to help them and their bodies be ready that something is going to happen and change so they can be ready again for the switch, again for the activity that's, that's coming to them. So mentally, we, do, we all do this, whether it's with work, whether it's with play. We have routines we build up. We, get, we transition into being ready to do something. We do the activity, and we transition out of it. We can't learn, we can't build um, our motor cortex and, and neural pathway until we have a thorough understanding of the beginning, middle, and end of an activity. And for all of you guys that are watching, if you've ever taken a dance class, an aerobics class, or done a new, even sporting activity, we're really bad at first, and we all know it's going to take practice, but we can't even get comfortable with practice until we know the beginning, middle, and end of that so we can be really good in the middle. And we can drag, you can get better by dragging and making the middle longer. 
instead of everything is new every time we try it. And that's a lot of times with our clientele what we're ending up with. Almost everything we do is a new activity for them instead of allowing them to build a neural pathway to get there. So, and I know that doesn't really seem like switch talk, but it, all of those kind of things are really important to understand to be, have success with your clients with activities or with whatever we're working on. Okay. The other question that you have to ask before you're even ready to do an assessment with somebody, what type of access are they going to have? Is it going to be a single switch access to a device? Are they get, so are they going to be automatic scanning? So you have to think about how are they going to relay the time? How is that going to help them or hinder them? Are we doing auditory scanning? There's another level that we have to think about uh, for that client. Are they doing dual switch scanning? So are they using two switches, one to move it themselves in their own, own time and the other to select it? And I will show you a client actually, a video in a little bit of a client actually doing dual switch step scanning and how wonderful she is at, at that activity. Are they doing mouse simulation? The, typically for computer access, that's a really incredible way to make um, a mouse move on a screen that they could either use their power chair or use just switches on a tray or a table to make a mouse move on the screen. The really cool thing about mouse simulation is it doesn't require software in the computer. It's only hardware. So you plug it in and the computer thinks it's a mouse. So I'm not having to lay software on top of other things to actually make that, that system work. I can actually just plug that mouse in, have them use a couple switches, and they can move that mouse around the screen wherever they want to. But that access doesn't always mean it's the best thing for somebody for a communication device. Maybe scanning is better for them. Maybe they're faster scanners with that. But just because we type on a keyboard for our computer doesn't mean we've all forgotten how to write with a pen. So we need multiple access methods for multiple things. And there are also access to head mouse and eye gaze. Definitely, I have clients that I work with that use both those access methods. But then another layer of things for somebody, how are they going to click if they're being a mouse? How are they going to dwell or select if, something is hap if they're trying to make something, something select? And how is that timing going to work for them? On an eye gaze system, is it being able to calibrate to their eyes? One other issue I have with them, with clients that use those kind of access methods, is are they going to be really in one environment or are they going to be in multiple environments? Eye gaze doesn't work so great out, outdoors. It really has to have a, a, a sensitive ambient light issue. So I have to not be able to change that too much in order for it to read me all the time. So a lot of factors, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't use that technology. We just need to know what those factors are to make it better for the clients we serve. Okay, all right, I'm gonna get to some switches really quick. And there are several different types of switches and I've only brought a few today and I, I don't have a power chair, but I'm gonna show you some videos of some clients accessing uh, technology through their power chair. But I also wanna show you, um, talk to you about clients that how they access technology without using a power chair, a manual wheelchair or you know, a desk sometimes depends on what someone is sitting in. If they can't use their hands or standard means of access to write, how we're gonna get them caught up in the classroom or how we're gonna make it, things accessible to them in all of their environments. Well, the types of switches that there are on, basically are, come into two categories and then a bunch of subcategories. The first category are mechanical switches. And there also are electronic switches. Electronic switches require power but no movement. Mechanical switches have moving parts on the inside. And on the screen, hopefully the, the presentation's up there, there are several different types of mechanical switches, but you need to determine what switch I'm going to use and why and how I'm going to use it to make those determinations. And as far as the sensors go, same thing. There are photoelectric switches. There are proximity sensors, things I just need to get close to to make them activate. So, and I'll show you how all of those work in just a second. First, I'm going to show you some mechanical switches. And I'll show you on this little handy dandy camera right here. I'll start with my favorite switch and I'm being facetious about this switch because I can't quite know how big a switch site needs to be in order for somebody to activate it. This switch happens to be called Big Red and it is a very big target of a switch. The reason really this was designed is for somebody basically with cerebral palsy that does not have good hand movement. 
they can actually bring their arm up, swing it around, and land on that switch somewhere. Which, again, if you think about the process of that, may not be the best idea depending on the activity you're doing. If I'm just trying to repeatedly activate a switch over and over because I have something automatically scanning and I want them to touch this switch in order to make a selection on their device, then I have to be able to have them repeatedly hit that switch. And if somebody has cerebral palsy and fluctuating tone so they can't control how easy it is, they can't use their finger in isolation, it's all big gross motor movements. One of the hardest things for them to do once they get on this switch is get off it. And they'll have to release it to make the selection and wind up and hit it again. So hopefully you can see if somebody is scanning a device, how long it may take them to make a selection repeatedly. So it really will cut down on the amount of words they can say or phrases they can print just by the fact that I'm using a very large gross motor movement for them to activate something. And again, I need to understand, am I using this switch in a single switch activation? Or if I'm using this switch on a power chair, I actually have to hit and hold this switch for a period of time to make my chair go. So if this is plugged into a device that would make my chair drive forward, I would only be able to drive forward for as long as I'm on this switch. And if I have cerebral palsy and I'm on this switch, like I said earlier, one of the hardest things for them to do is once I finally got to my target and hit that, I can't release easily. So I either have to push past that extension to get off it or I'm stuck here. And if I have something coming up that I need to stop on, the, harder, the more I anticipate that, the harder it is for me to release that switch and get off it. So really need to think about what is the switch activation for? Where does it need to be? Can I mount it somewhere else that they don't have to use a gross motor movement? Or is that the best switch site for the activity we're trying? If I have to repeatedly hit it, I might have to make my device be very slow. If I can hit and hold it, I need to make sure that I can get off that switch when I want to. Oh, and I'm not trying to bash the big red. I'm just saying I need, you need to understand the function of the switches to understand which one I would even start or try with. Now, this is a, considered a mechanical switch. It has what we call an eighth inch mono jack plug. It has one ring on the tip, and this plug plugs into almost any device. Everything in the US actually has this standard plug. So I could plug it directly into a communication device or a reset port on my wheelchair or a five switch adapter to make my wheelchair drive. That being said, mechanical switches also are mechanical. I do not need power to make it activate. There's a spring on the inside of this, so when I touch this, it activates that switch in any direction, which also can be a problem. If I'm using this on my power chair and I'm going over bumps and shaking, sometimes that causes activation. So we want to make sure that we stay away from things activating on their own or not when they're not supposed to. That's something that's really important, okay? Other types of mechanical switches, again, this is, happens to be called an egg switch. And this egg switch has um, one nice thing about it, is it has a filament on the inside. So if this is mounted on someone's tray or armrest or down by their leg and there gets to be um, food and stuff down in there, the food and stuff does not get in that switch and it will not get on the, in on the spring on the inside. And that's why it was made that way. You can activate it from any side or corner or the middle, but the same thing. It is a mechanical switch, so it does take some force to activate. It doesn't feel like much to us, but for a client with weakness that can't push hard, it can be too hard. For a client with cerebral palsy that can't grade how hard that is, I still will be using all of my force to make that switch activate. So I need to decide, is it going to be somewhere where I, their hand is going to be using it and they can, they can swipe by it to do a reset of a power chair or activation of a communication device? Or might it be better that I can actually activate it by their cheek or, or their head at the top so I can mount it on a headrest swing arm. So here they are. A lot of times, though, I want to make sure that someone's not going to be banging on that because no matter what, it's going to eventually hurt. So I want to make sure that this switch is mounted in a place they can get on and off it easily and they don't have to bang on it to make it activate. I use a lot of egg switches for reset switches of power wheelchairs, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit and tell you how they activate. 
Other switches, this is considered a wobble switch, and a lot of companies make mechanical switches, so you can actually go um, look, look at several of them, and, and just, just by its shape alone, I always tell everybody, try to figure out maybe what type of access it was made for. This is, has a spring on the inside. This wobble switch is typically meant to be mounted on the side of someone's armrest so they can actually activate the switch and even go through it if they need to so they don't get stuck on something and hung up on the switch. Again, it typically is a momentary switch access. So just that I'm just going to hit this one time or go through it and the switch is going to close, I'm going to make something happen. It's not meant for long-term, long-time activation. It would work that way, but again, it would be really hard, difficult for a client, I believe, to access that in that, that way. And we have some light touch mechanical switches. This switch is a called an ultralight switch. It's, it's uh, I hate to say cousin because it's made by a different manufacturer, but the micro light switch is, a, is kind of its, its counterpart, which a lot of people have, have seen a micro light switch. And it is a very light touch switch, a light spring, and it's on a little le lever. And it's meant to be activated just at the end. So someone with weakness would be able to activate this switch versus some of the other ones. But you have to know, if I'm working with a client with a disability of weakness and their thumb does this, I get very excited because that's a switch site that we may be able to, to plug a, sw a switch in and put it right there. They can activate a communication device or a computer or a power chair. But what you have to remember is a lot of times with weakness, you get a lot of fatigue. So if my finger will work this way 20 times, it may not work 21. So I need to make sure that I have this mounted in a place that they can access it when they need to, and it's not going to be really fatiguing. So again, it's a really great switch, but it still has a spring that has to be activated and pushed. All right. One of the greatest things about mechanical switches is they're cheap. One of the hardest things about mechanical switches is they're cheap. <laughs> they break a lot. So you can, again, have multiple ones of those and plug them in and try it. But one of the things I also want to tell everybody, and when I start talking about sensors, I really love it that there is actually no auditory cue in a sensor. Now, today I'm going to show you one so you can see them activate, but I've had a lot of clinicians tell me they like to hear that click because it will tell the client something is happening. I actually disagree with that thought because, because I hear this click doesn't mean the switch is working. It can still click and not the switch may not at this end be working. It happens all the time. So that cue typically means to me I'm teaching them to wait. And I would rather have them access this and something happen immediately than teach them to wait for a click and wait for something else to happen. So, and again, I'll try not to get on too many soapboxes, but those are some of my big issues with uh, switches. And I do a lot of all kinds of switches, mechanical and electronic. But there are some issues with electronic switches, and I, I don't want to say issues other than um, some more things you have to think about is how is a client going to access the switch again? Are they positioned to access the device? Is the device ready for them to access? You know, again, have we built a transition in for them? And is my switch ready to go? If I'm using a sensor, how do I power up that switch? Because they require power. There's no moving parts on the inside. I'll show you a couple of them right now. Okay. And like I said, sensors require power. So this is a battery pack that's rechargeable, and the charger looks like this. It'll last up to three to four days of constant use without being charged. But this, there's um, lithium ion batteries on the inside of this, and I can plug in my uh, sensor to this, uh, this box put it on someone's manual wheelchair or in their bed if I'm trying to access their device in their bed. And um, they can, again, use that sensor for a long period of time. If I am using a power chair, move this stuff out of the way, I can actually plug those sensors directly into the wheelchair batteries. And it will not take any power from those batteries. So it's not going to drain the batteries any more than anybody would ever notice. So if I'm using three switches at a headrest for someone to drive, I power up right through the wheelchair batteries. If I'm using a manual wheelchair or something like that, I want to use a battery pack. 
And if I'm using it from someone's bed or at a workstation, then I can plug them actually directly into the wall. So all of, there's three ways I can power that up. Depending on the station I'm going to be at would depend on which of these I would try to, to choose. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you re real quick how a sensor works. This box is just to show you, I better put it under here before I forget, activation of a switch. So, I have it plugged into power. I have my switch, and I don't know, can you guys see that little red light coming on? And, and, and all this mess. This is a proximity sensor. This switch with this little small target area right here activates just when I get near that switch. I do not have to press it. So it's a sensor that's looking for something that has an electronic charge, like our bodies. So when I get near it, activation occurs. I can put something on top of it that isn't electronically charged, and it will not activate. When I put my finger over that, it will activate. That's how we can take these sensors and put them in pads of a headrest. Those are the same sensors, there th happens to be three of them in here, that are inside each wing of this headrest. And I can adjust how, how sensitive they are or how near I need to get them by adjusting the wings of the headrest. And there are several styles of headrests, which I'll get to in just a little bit, uh, reasons I would pick different ones. But sensors are really cool because location is activation. So if I have somebody that has cerebral palsy and they bang on a switch or have a really hard time getting to that, I can actually just put it near their head and that makes activation occur. Just getting near something. Or if I have somebody with weakness and they can't move their finger well, I can just roll on and off. I can put these inside a tray. I can put them anywhere, inside Velfoam if I want to, and to, st to stick them onto something. So just your location is the activation. There is no pressure required. And that's one thing that actually has made those very, very successful for a lot of clients that, that I work with. There are some other types of switches. We have adjustable proximity sensors. I'll move this stuff out of the way. I'll try not to make too big of a mess because I always do. <clears throat> this sensor, I'm not going to plug it in anything because it has a click on its own, is an adjustable proximity sensor. You can actually adjust this to go through at least a half an inch to three quarters inch of an object above it. So as long as that whatever it's connected to by Velcro, high-tech Velcro, is not thicker than about one inch, you can actually take an adjustment tool and adjust this sensor up and down. In fact, I turned it down so much it's off. So if I had a person with a thicker tray that I needed to stick this through, the sensor would work actually through that tray all the way up to a half an inch. Now I hope somebody doesn't have a, a, a tray on their chair that's a half an inch thick, but if they had something, I've used these on a person's footrest that had plastic footrests before. When their foot was down, the switch was off. When they lifted their toes up on that, uh, off that footrest, that actually caused the switch to close, and so they could reset their wheelchair. So there's a lot of things you can do with these and places you can put them. And again, I just need to get near it to make it activate. There is no pressure required, which is something that's really cool about sensors. And another type of a switch. Maybe. Another type of a switch is, aha. This is a, a little bit different category of a, of a sensor, and it's called a photoelectric uh, category, which means there's a beam of light coming out of this switch. It's called, they're called fiber optics. And with fiber optics, there are always two cables that come out of the sensor head, which is, which is what this is called. These two cables are one omits the light, and the other, when you actually cover the, the um, end of this, the reflection goes back through that other cable and causes the switch to close. They're really uh, a great switch. This happens to be a large fiber optic switch. I might as well talk about this while I'm here. Um, 
they're really incredibly cool switches for somebody with weakness because that's really the, its primary function. On a fiber optic switch, I can get them so close together that I can have four or five switches in a range of an inch. So all I have to do is cover the edge of that switch and um, if I have like four switches together, I can make one of those directions be forward, one left, one right, and one reverse. So someone could drive their chair within this much range, which I'll show you someone doing that in just a little bit. This is called an illumination box. And this box actually plugged into power basically just gives us the light function for this switch. When I plug the switch ends into the illumination box, See if I can really plug them into the illumination box, like that. Then I have an adjustment pot on the side that I can adjust these to be long range or short range. This fiber optic switch will go out to approximately four inches. Okay, I can actually take a dial, this dial right here, and turn it down to make it go to almost about a quarter inch away. This right now is about a half inch. Okay, so if I have somebody that I'm using their finger and I have this underneath a tray and I want their finger coming in to make that activation occur, I can actually make that happen by adjusting the switch. And if, it, if their finger is a little further away, I can adjust it a little bit longer. Like I was showing you earlier, if somebody is using their thumb, Again, I, it really is hugely ener energy conservation for clients with weakness. All I have to do is get my thumb mo to move back and forth. There's no pressure, no pushing on anything. So a client that maybe can't use a mechanical switch can still continue to use an electronic switch or a fiber optic switch for a very long time. This particular switch we use a lot of times for clients that drive their chair with what we call sip and puff and it typically is mounted onto a straw, and I'll show you that, um, uh, how that functions in just a little bit when I show you some of the other drive control systems. Okay, so one of the things you have to consider when you're looking at electronic switches are that they require power. So I have to be able to either plug that into a wall, I have to have a power chair, wheelchair batteries, or I have to be able to um, figure out how I'm going to use a, a portable uh, battery and uh, charger. Okay, I would like to show you Gretchen. And Gretchen is um, a really great lesson in why um, an electronic switch will work versus a mechanical switch for somebody. Now, uh, she lives in the Pennsylvania area, and besides being adorable, she sits in a regular desk chair in her high school, which I'm very excited about. But her, she requires 100% assistance for her to use her device. I'm going to talk about her just for a second before I continue. Um, her, she's using a single switch scanning method. So she's scanning through her, her, what we call quadrant scanning on her device. And as this scans through, she uses her left or right leg, excuse me, to activate a switch that's mounted on, on the desk chair leg. Okay. So, and she is very capable. It's incredible to see how capable this young girl is. And um, again, I'm still hoping she's working on getting a power chair because she would be totally independent with powered mobility and activation if she had that. But Gretchen uses her leg to whack on that switch that far out there. And hopefully you guys are seeing this video and saying, why not just move it in? Well, here's my friend Karen moving a switch in to show the difference between her having to reach so far out to get to the switch and close. Remember, it's still a mechanical switch she's using. So that red switch, no matter what, even if we move it close or, or in between those two, she has to wind up to hit it because she can't grade just a little bit of hitting. She has to move a lot to make anything activate a mechanical switch. Here she is with a sensor and watch very carefully at the difference. So that's a proximity sensor, just like the gray one I just showed you. It just happens to be yellow. And she's so used to whacking the switch that she does that one time. But when, as soon as she figures out she does not have to, she just has to barely move to get there. Watch the difference in her body. And this really, I can only promise you, happens on a regular basis when you're using a sensor versus a mechanical switch. It makes all the difference in the world. But see, she just has to roll her foot out, just roll her foot out, and that makes activation. 
She's waiting, waiting for her device to scan. Now, that's all and good, and that made her much faster accessing her device. The problem we have now is it's only a single switch. And if we can move her to dual switch scanning, she'll be twice as fast. But it's real hard to find dual switch scanning on each side of her knee. So we actually moved the sensors up and put them in a headrest and mounted them on her desk chair. Now she can, with the left and right movements of her head, move through the selections herself and then activate it with the other switch. And watch how she does this. And just in a matter of uh, practicing this twice, she was almost five, six times faster at actually getting words on the page. Because first, she doesn't have to bang. Second, she has two switches that she can move herself through time. She's not waiting for scanning to occur. So again, speed is a key, especially when you're in a regular ed classroom and she needs to answer questions in real time. So we're trying to move forward. And she's also going to begin to start using uh, mouse simulation. So she has that type of access on her computer so she doesn't have to have extra software on there uh, for, for people to you know, have to figure out how we're going to get to each of the sections of the computer. But this is her answering a question, question in real time on the page. And this is one of the first weeks of school and they're writing a uh, class creed and she's giving one of the answers that she thinks that should be in their, in their class creed. Which is almost done. Which is still painful even though we're just um, uh, watching her move. And there she is. Her teacher comes over and is going to tell the class. Her, she thinks that if they should write in there that they should all look at the teacher when she talks to them, So, which is pretty darn cool. All right. One of the big things that I always like to talk about, too, is when do you give up on a method that you have been working on? And if you're looking for optimal methods, the RESNA standard used to state that if you could hit a switch site eight out of 10 times in a row, then you were uh, competent enough that was, that was considered okay. Well, I actually, I think that's a little hard because I can't imagine that any human being can hit, do anything eight out of 10 times uh, correctly. We, we were filled with mistakes. Any human that we try to do anything 10 times in a row the exact same way, we cannot do it. That's another reason why are we interested in the activity we're doing, it'll make all the difference in the world in are we more accurate with that activity. And that I don't like to count switch hits, but I can tell you I've also worked with a lot of clients that have been working on stuff for a year, and that was Gretchen. She's been working on her device for a very long time, and she's very fluid with it. But that access method for one year, over one year she's been doing. And you know, in two different class periods, she was able to move to dual switch step scanning and be 10 times faster. So we never get to stop looking for new access methods and better access methods. And if we can make somebody faster at, at participating in an activity, that's really what we're trying to do. And now we're trying to move her towards powered mobility. Okay. Um, I, when do you give up on a method? I say try for about two weeks. If you think it's not really going well, start somewhere new. But you also have to give someone time to learn what you're doing. We have to have some consistency built in there. But I also don't stay too long because it gets boring, frustrating, and then clients also give up on us when we're trying to figure stuff out. Okay. Um, again, what are we trying to access? Those are very important things. Are we accessing a power chair? I hope so. Are we accessing a computer? I hope so. For every single client I work with, if they can communicate with me, which is, we, I don't get to see too many of those clients, um, then my next two things are, how are we accessing a power chair and how are we accessing a communication device? I mean a computer, excuse me. Those are things that we have to have. Those are chances that our clients will have at really a, a tremendous vocation, which is really what we need. So. If their hands don't work well, if they have fluctuating tone, if they have weakness, now how are we going to do the, all of those things in an alternative way? 
in a way that we haven't thought of yet or in a way that, that they can still do their entire environment maybe with just two switches or maybe with just three switches. And well, I'll talk about some of that in just a little bit. Um, and is that client using a communication device and a power wheelchair and a computer? Are they using a manual wheelchair? How are we going to have them access things from all of those settings? And my other biggest thing that we haven't even begun to tackle yet, how are they going to access those things when they're in bed? How do they access a call button? How do they, how do they turn the channel of their TV? How do they access their computer? So all of those things are very, very important to know and think of when we're trying to do an assessment for somebody. Okay? All right. When we talk about powered mobility and access, this is the same, basically the same headrest that Gretchen used. We call this one a mini, and I think it's kind of a bad name, but it's, it's a smaller version of the headrest that we used to make. And there are three sensors in this headrest. And that's one thing that makes it a little bit difficult for somebody because if I am driving a power chair, I have forward, right, left, how do I get reverse? Well, there are several ways that that can happen. This happens to be what we call an interface box. This plugs into the wheelchair's electronics. This, this particular one happens to be for an Invacare chair. I know because it plugs into their bus, which looks exac exactly like this. My head array cable is this one. I plug directly into this. It's eight pin round connector. So I am connected electronically to my wheelchair controller. This is my interface box. And now really all you have to do, remember about that one. And my head array is now plugged in. So if I take a programmer, which I had up here, this happens to be a programmer for an Invacare power chair. I plug this into where I charge the chair and turn it on and tell the chair, I want you to drive with switches because all chairs are made to be driven with joysticks. I don't care if it's a Pride, a Promobile, an Invacare, or a Sunrise. They come ready to standardly to drive with a joystick. And if I'm trying to do it with alternative access, I need to have a way to tell it we're changing that access method. And typically, it's always a programmer I need. All the wheelchair manufacturers' programmers look a little bit different. There's no two alike. And they're proprietary. So this one will only work on Invacare chairs. But once I have this, I can go tell the chair, I'm going to drive you digitally, OK? Not proportionally. So this is digital input. I touch the switch. My chair will go. This is connected to forward. I put my head back here. I will drive forward. I have a right and I have a left switch. Now the same thing. If I'm working on a mouse or something, I, I, how am I going to make three of these switches make a mouse move? Because I have several func functions to do. And I'm going to show you that at the end of the presentation today. But I have to be able to move the mouse up, down, left, right, click. I need double click. And click and drag also is really important because who doesn't want to play solitaire on their computer? So I have to be able to do that. So how can I make all of those functions happen with just three switches? That's where software and, and other functions come in. And I'll show you that in just a little bit. But three switches versus four directions, things get a little more difficult. So I have to be, have a thorough understanding of how this stuff works. And I'm just going to tell you guys, if you get a chance to play around with wheelchair electronics, please grab a programmer and make some changes because it can make the difference between your client being successful with powered mobility and actually failing at powered mobility. Okay. Now, this interface box will allow me to do several things. I can take a switch, and often this is what I use a mechanical switch for, plug it into the back of my, pro my uh, interface box, and if I have my chair programmed right, I touch the switch one time, that changes my forward direction to reverse. I touch it again, I'm back and forward, and my chair will drive in a forward direction. Okay? ASL's interface box also has a direct reverse port. I can plug a switch right in here and make my chair back up. So the minute I, we call this a hot reverse, the minute I touch this switch or just kind of glance it, my chair will back up. And I've worked with a lot of clients that have taught me a lot of things. One of the main ones, especially with clients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, is they never get up to a table that they have to back away from because reverse is hard. There's a lot of people I know drive that way. They don't want to get anywhere. They have to back out of a spot. So they'll try to drive around until they find a place to go forward. 
Well, that's no different. For a client that's hard to get to reverse, then I might want to put just something so they can glance at it, back up a tiny bit, and turn and get out of the situation they're in. Okay? So, up on reverse, we'll find a way once someone actually is driving. But if, they're, if that's really that important for you, there's several ways you can make reverse happen. Okay? Now, on the screen, there are several different styles of headrests. And we have several styles for a lot of reasons. One is, let me see what time we got here. Okay. One is, I'm going to put this back behind my head to show you. One reason I like this mini style headrest is it's small. And again, hopefully what we're seeing when we see somebody driving a parachair or accessing something is the client and not the hardware or the headrest that they're using to drive it with. I have forward, right, and left. Now, some of the, the junior curved headrest, and the, there's a lot of people that like those, and I'm not necessarily a fan of that because, like I said earlier, the switch acti activation has to be immediate. So I need my programmer to say, turn my chair on to say, the minute I do this, my chair is going to turn. There's not going to be waiting, especially if you're working with a client with cerebral palsy. Because if I touch this right here and they don't move, what happens is they think I need force. I need to push, push, push. And then all of a sudden, my forehead's making me go left, my ear is making me go right, and my occiput's making me go, um, go right. Sorry, my ear is making me go forward. So I get stuck in an ATNR and I can't get out of that. So, and then sometimes then either clients or the therapists they're working with give up on that. And really what happened is the chair was not programmed that when they went here, the chair moved. Not fast though. You can actually program acceleration to be high. So it m gets to my top speed quickly, but the speed to be low. So I'm not making a carnival ride. All right. So that's all of those things are really important, but the shape of the headrest can do the same thing. If a client goes to one side and they can't find that sensor, the same thing is going to occur. So that's one reason I've gone to a lot smaller headrests in, in the not distant um, past. Okay, I'm not a big fan of our curved head array. Um, we've actually tried to get rid of that, and some people said, you can't, you can't, I love it. So, and I'll show you a client, um, actually I probably won't today, that uses it and would be very mad at me if we discontinued that one. But we have the Elite, which actually you can move those sensors anywhere. I can bring it down to a chin for somebody if I need to. There's a lot of things that we need to really have very adjustable, but once it gets adjusted in the proper place, it needs to stay there. So you can kind of lock them in and keep them in one spot. All right. Now, the same sensor we can actually use in a tray array. So if someone does have good hand function or they can slide across a tray to make something activate, we can put those same gray sensors I showed you and the black ones underneath that tray. This happens to be an eclipse tray and it's hollow. So you can put all of those wires on the inside so if somebody is using their hand, they don't get caught up inside those wires or pull them. And you just stick them on the bottom of that tray with Velcro and then put the bottom on it so it keeps them up tight against that tray there. And you can move them around, put them wherever somebody can function. I've w worked with a lot of clients where we, they cannot take their head off this back pad on the head array. So I unplug forward here and put forward down on a tray for them so they can just drive with their hand and look left and right. Okay, so there's just tons of options you can do for somebody that really can't access a joystick. And I really do believe we really try too hard with joysticks for too long and some uh, clients get very frustrated. And uh, so do therapists. <laughs> so, okay, getting back to fiber optics. Like I was telling you earlier, this, they're photoelectric. So somebody that has very, very limited range of motion can actually activate these. I'd like you to meet Salome, and Salome is a client with spinal muscular atrophy. She's out of Mississippi, and she hadn't been able to drive her power chair for about three years. And her medical, her medical supplier had told her that they didn't really have any options for her chair. You know, it was kind of, they, they made the spring as light as possible, and she wasn't going to be able to drive anymore. Well, she also has been vented since she was two, and she really doesn't talk well. So she's, eh, and her mom can understand what she's trying to say. She'll say, you know, I want a Diet Coke, so her mom run gets her a Diet Coke. Well, school wasn't, I don't think, necessarily believing that Salome was really asking for something. And when she would go to school, they had stuck her into, into the to life skills classroom, and Salome was just sitting there all day. So she came home one day and told her mom that she just didn't want to, you know, there's nothing for her left to do. And so she thinks she's about ready to, to not live anymore. 
and her mom said, we've got to find something to get her interested. We've got to get her back into life. Went online and, and found um, a website that had alternative access stuff and gave us a call and said, I see you guys do some things. Could you please, you know, my daughter's about at the end and she wants to drive. She wants to be able to do something on her own again. So we had a tray with fiber optic switches on it, and this is one that's in the top left corner, corner up there. And those are the fiber optics, and you can even put them a little closer than that together. Um, and we sent it to them. Now, the chances of this working are, and I probably can't say what I want to on, on screen, but are like nil. Because when you can only move this much, and actually for her it was this finger, we don't know where the this much is. So it could be here. It, wherever and close far away sometimes rotated over more so those already being pre-mounted was like there's no way this is going to work but we're going to try it anyway send it to you so we sent her the tray we sent her a programmer for her mom because they didn't have a medical supplier involved at all with them anymore and um, said when you open the box call us and we'll help you program the chair so they opened up the box pulled it out mom said okay i'm ready we had her plug the programmer in and she, um, we made sure it was safe speeds and safe everything for a new driver. And she called back crying in about an hour and said, please, can I keep this? My daughter's down visiting the neighbors by herself for the first time in years. So we're like, oh, my God, just keep it. I can't believe that worked. It was so shocking. It was, you know, I could not believe it worked. So we got a call about a year later from Make-A-Wish, and Salome's wish was to come meet us. And, of course, it, this story always makes me almost cry again. Because when she got to Texas, I said, you wasted your wish. We, <laughs> you could have went anywhere. We would have came to visit you. Um, but I'm telling the story because she was in a life skills classroom and really still not doing much. But when she got back driving her power chair, people believed in her again that she could do stuff. And when she came to visit us, we hooked her up with mouse simulation so that she was able to use that same finger and those same switches to run the mouse on her computer. She graduated high school in two years. So she's super, super smart, genius smart. And again, it really does. We've got to get people mobile. We've got to get them accessing uh, computers. And she she's, uh, was working on a graphic arts degree. So again, there's ways to make things happen, even for the clients with the most disabilities. This is how a fiber, what fiber optics look like. The large one is on top, the one we have. And the small one is underneath. And typically we use the small ones in a tray, and that's what Salome drove with because they were closer. This large fiber optic switch in the middle of the page there is typically we attach this to a sip and puff straw. And this can actually, out at four inches, be reading your mouth. And I again have another client that I work with that is a sip and puff driver. I'll explain that really quickly if someone doesn't know what that is. It's a way to drive a chair just with your breath. If you puff hard in a straw, the chair will go forward in a latched motion, motion, so like cruise control in your car, because you don't want to keep until you turn blue and then breathe again. So you give it a hard puff, and that's going to make you continue forward until you give it a hard sip to stop. So hard puff forward, soft puff right turn, hard sip reverse, soft sip left turn. So again, this guy that, that I was working with was probably the best sip and puff driver I've ever seen in my entire life. He could do anything. He even had latched reverse on, which typically they don't ever give you. And he and his wife and I were in the mall, and her and I were just yakking it up, not paying any attention, and he's headed for this glass partition, glass wall to a store, and we look up and run over there and turn his chair off and like, oh my God, what happened? You know, and he's laughing, and we're panicked. And <clears throat> I said, Bill, what happened? And then we noticed his straw was sticking down here. He had no way to stop his chair because his, he needed a sip in his straw to make it stop. Well, they had a tree in the mall that the big branch came out and grabbed that straw right out of his mouth and ripped it off to the side, and he was just going for a ride because he was not able to stop the chair. Well, um, again, built-in safeties is something ever since that day, and that was been over 20 years ago, that I've put into every sip and puff driver I've worked with. This can be normally closed switch. So it's right by that straw. If, if for some reason the straw gets pulled away from his mouth, the chair would have stopped. So until that gets back into a range where it's reading his face again, so out to about four inches. So again, safety is the key with powered mobility, especially when you're driving in a latched mode. But that's typically what we use that large fiber optic switch for. <clears throat> and the small fiber optic switch is the one that Salome used with just her finger sliding over back and forth. And actually, it was this one. 
And <clears throat> again, it's uh, they're incredible switches. They're really made for somebody with weakness. So is typically what we use them for or uh, sip and puff straw. Okay, on the market today, we really only have about five chairs to, to five wheelchair brands to pick from. Invacare is one, Pride Mobility is one, Permobil is one, Sunrise Medical, and Autobach is, is new to the US. Out of those five, there really are only three different types of electronics that we need to know. Invacare has Mark 5.6, Pride has Curtis Electronics, and Autobach has Curtis Electronics. Permobil uses uh, electronics they buy from Europe called Arnett, and actually so does Sunrise use Arnett Electronics. So three programmers you would have to have to be able to make changes for somebody's powered wheelchair, for them to be able to access anything. Now, um, they, sadly they don't come on the chair. It's something that's extra that, that uh, medical suppliers should have. But really I do believe that you guys should have an in-service at the minimum on how to program wheelchairs uh, to make it optimal for your clients because it can make the difference between being able to drive and not or being able to access a communication or comp device or computer or not, which are two huge things when you're talking a lot of dollars on a power wheelchair. Okay? <clears throat> now, thank you. One of the things that um, are very important that does not also come on a wheelchair, standard with it, you can order it, and I believe you should always order this, is what I call an output module. Now, again, I only brought Invacare Electronics in here with me today, but they all have a box. This particular box is called an ECU board, okay, or an auxiliary module. And on that slide I have right there, it has the name for each one, and I'll go over them just a little bit. But these two ports are what's really important. If I have somebody that drives their power chair with a head array or a joystick, and I want that joystick to be a mouse on my computer, then I need to be able to tell it I need to get a signal out to do something. And that's what this box is. It's an output box. So this particular one has two ports, this uh, Invacare box I have. And I don't have that cable. But there is a cable that's called a D9 that will plug from here into a communication device, mouse simulator, or anything else, a door opener for clients. We have those, those things set up. But I cannot get that signal from my drive control system to do something else unless I have one of these boxes. And again, the chairs do not come with them. We have to ask for them and we have to justify their need. Now, I've not had huge success justifying uh, environmental control things for clients with disabilities, especially if I'm accessing a computer. But this box also can access a mouse simulator. That mouse simulator can access my communication device. So also written communication is communication. And there's a lot of places that actually do pay for these. So it's something you need to ask for. They run between um, like $1,500 to $800, depending on which one, one up front. But if you're involved in ordering a wheelchair for somebody at the order, I tell at the start, get this right up front because actually it costs you less money to order it when you order the wheelchair than it does after. It's, it's no different than car parts. Car parts cost more later. Okay, so if you're feeling bad about that, just think you're saving money. I try to tell my husband that all the time. I got it on sale. I saved money. Okay, so Promobil and Sunrise, that box they use is called an input-output module and that gives you one port. Pride and Autobach use um, Curtis Electronics and that box is called an auxiliary module. And Invacare Mark VI, it's called an um, ACM or ECU module, both of them, okay? I would like you to meet Ellie. And Ellie is, drives a Permobile power chair and she uses a Vanguard communication device. And we're working on getting Ellie completely independent with mobility and communication access. And I'm gonna show you just real quick how her system is set up. Oops, sorry, I don't need this volume. Okay, and um, I'm not going to show you the volume today, but she actually does it, some pretty incredible things with her device, but we'll just have to watch today. And her, she's in a front-wheel drive Koala is the type of chair she has, and she's using an, uh, an elite head array, so um, going back and forth. And this is something I absolutely love about her therapist that help her get set up. 
She has no problem with that device being right where Ellie needs it to be for her to use it. Even though she's driving her power chair, it's mounted right in the front. I know a lot of people that get really worried about that is how she going to see. We can't mount it there. Well, her therapist mounted it there and then saw what obstacles she needed to overcome. So, and this is what I love about, about her therapist is that she didn't pretty worry about that. She worried about, she was going to try to help Ellie find ways to get around. How do you see this? Do we need to mount it lower? Do we need to move it here? Do we need to it left or right? To, so you have a better uh, field of vision. But Ellie, as you can see, if you're watching that video, doesn't need it. She is an amazing driver, even though that device is right where we would all consider it right in the way for her vision. So, and from mobility, we use visual memory. We don't really just watch where we're going or we'd watch our feet all the time. So she uses visual memory. And again, she's a little OCD because she lines right up on that thing every single time. She's got to hit it right in the middle and can't do any different. So she's an incredible driver. If her device was not mounted right there, it would be in her backpack, just like most of the clients that I work with. Then if she wanted to say to something to somebody, they would have to stop the chair, get the device out of the backpack, get the mount out of the backpack, put it all together, boot it up. Ten minutes later, they may be able to tell a person hi that had already left. So we've got to be able to combine this technology much more frequently. And it's not difficult literally to combine those two things. It is that box I just showed you and a cable and that's all she needs. Now Ellie is a dual switch step scanner so she moves with her right pad of her head array she selects with the left. So she's going back and forth between the two and she's a very fast scanner. She has about over 60 pages of uh, 64 selections on her device. So she's, again, incredibly rich language, incredibly good user. And here she is telling a joke. So a knock-knock joke. And then she's actually, she's that little smile and that devious face. Um, Going to play a song. As she gets there closer, she gets more excited because she turned the volume all the way up on her device, and it about makes your ears bleed. It's so loud. Oh, which I'll get past this real quick because you guys can't hear it. Now, one of the issues we're having with Ellie because of the wheelchair electronics she has on her chair is how does she go from making her, her head array drive her chair to actually making her be able to talk? And on the type of electronics she has, She's got to be able to hit a reset switch two times in a time sequence and then tap the back pad, just the back pad, until she gets her to her auxiliary module and then select it. Well, we've tried and tried switch placement, switch location for her. She can get down actually the double switch hit time, but what she can't do then is only touch the back pad and not touch the left or right so it gets her into a different mode. So we are still working on that with her, trying to figure out how we can better assist her to be independent. Because she, if she didn't have that one obstacle with those electronics, she would not need an adult to go to class with her, which is huge. So again, something that we, I always strive for is to see how we can get total independence. And Ellie is one of those persons that totally could. Okay. Um, I think this might be my last one, and I'm going to show you how a mouse simulator works, and we'll be done. Um, we'd like you to meet Royal, and Royal is also a head array driver, so she's what we call a three-quadrant driver. But Royal isn't using scanning on her device. She's driving her head array with her chair, she pulls up to her device, and she's actually mouse simulating on her device. Which, how that works, so you guys can get a little bit clearer picture before I showed you. She has it set up, so the mouse moves up and down on one pad left and right on the other, and select is on the back pad. So move, 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 and select. So I'm going to show you Royal real quick and how she act activates her system. As soon as they get it out of the program mode. There we go. So she moves it up and down with one pad, left and right with the other. And while you guys are watching that, I'm going to get this ready.
I make a mess everywhere I go. And her speech therapist that's working where this is in Philadelphia um, is trying to actually work on sentence structure with her. So she's not just mean, mean that I told her she was. She's actually making her ask for the plurals and everything in the correct manner on her sentence. So, <laughs> but at least she gets cookies at the end because that's what she's asking for. <laughs> And there she is. She touches that switch that's on the side, that red switch, and turns her chair from, from talking mode to drive mode and turns around and drives away. Now, Royal's device is not mounted on her chair right now for several reasons. One, she doesn't live in a situation that she can take that device home, uh, but they're trying to figure out how she can mount it on her chair so she has it in all of her classrooms and the schools that she's, that she's in. Okay? Now... I'm going to show you, in this big jumbled mess, of how you can make a mouse simulator work. This is basically what, what we consider um, off-chair mouse simulation because it's, we throw it in everything that you need in a backpack and can be slung over a, a, either a manual wheelchair or a desk chair if you wanted to. This is a mouse simulator right here. Okay, and this is an older version of a mouse simulator. But this box basically tells the, the computer how I want the mouse to work, all right? This is a standard USB port from the mouse simulator to my computer. Okay. Now, get here. So that's plugged in. In order to plug my mouse simulator into my electronics, because we're going to use a head array to make that work, I'm going to plug in that same gray cable I was telling you about that goes into the ECU port is this one. And it's related to directions. I'm going to unplug this. Okay. Each one of these cables has a letter on it, and they're all related to a direction. So if we're going to work this like Royal did, if I want my forward direction or my direction of my headrest to be left click, I plug that into the port that says left click. If I want my reverse, I don't have because there's no reverse on a head array. My right direction to be up and down, plug that in there. My left, or the one with the L on it, to be left and right, I plug that in there. And I need switch 11 on the bottom of this to be in the up direction, which means it's going to work in a three switch mode, which I'm going to show you in a second. This is what we call a 12 volt interface. This will not work on a power chair, it will only work when you're actually uh, setting up a, something that's off power, okay? So I need a battery pack that we talked about to plug in my switches, okay? So we have this connected. All I should be able to do is plug my head array in, make sure I have power, my light's on, that button's pushed, and if the technology gods are working right with us today, my mouse will move left and right when I touch the left pad. It will move up and down when I touch my right pad. Let me get over to something over here. And if I want to click, see if I can click and drag on there. Now that beep just meant that I'm actually clicking and dragging because I clicked and held on the click switch. Now I should be able to move that icon and click and let it go. So all of the functions I need to be a mouse are right here. I don't need anything else. If I'm using a four quadrant system, if I have a tray for somebody or a joystick, I can plug the, the switches in differently and then every direction is related to movement. But then I need a switch for click because it's almost always important for you to figure out how am I going to click a mouse. And the coolest thing about this, anybody can do it. I can plug direct switches into there, put them on a tray for someone to hit and make the mouse move. It's really a huge chance at a vocation for our clients and for them to be able to get into inputs things. 
If you can move a mouse around the screen, you can search a lot of things. If I want to type, I need to find some kind of on-screen keyboard. Almost every computer these days has a, um, an under accessibility, it's an on-screen keyboard. It may not be the greatest one, but it's there for you to try to use. So if I wanted to type to Word, if I want to type an email address, it's there for me to use. So um, I guess that's all I have to show you for today. And we have some other housekeeping stuff that um, uh, we need to go over. So thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate it, and hope to see you all sometime in Texas. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Please remember to fill out the evaluation. The link.